So you're probably wondering, what the heck is group theory? And more importantly, what the heck is a group? Well, group theory is a subsection of an area of maths called abstract algebra. Roughly speaking, abstract algebra is concerned with the study of mathematical objects and structures. The ones we're going to look at today are groups. So we define a group as some set G, along with a binary operation. They conform to some certain axioms. Quite wordy, right? Well, unfortunately, most of the questions we answer in abstract algebra seem to pose a hundred more. We need to define these terms properly to really understand groups. So firstly, a set is just some collection of items, like 1, 2, and 3, or 50, 60, and minus 1. But they can also be more abstract, like triangle, square, circle, or a set of functions or matrices. Although in practice, we tend to come across more sensible ones, some of which contain infinitely many elements, like the integers and the natural numbers, and other ones we can't write down so simply, like the real numbers, which contains every number on the real line. Going back to our definition of a group, the next thing we need to understand is a binary operation. This is a little conceptual, but it's essentially just a procedure that takes two elements from a set and combines them in some well-defined way, like addition or multiplication. But in general, it can be more abstract than that. Like if my set contains some functions, and my binary operation took two functions and made their composite, which is also in the set. It's important to remember that binary operations are not always commutative. This means that a dot b is not always equal to b dot a. A good example of this is matrix multiplication. Okay, so two parts of this monster definition down. On to the third part, which unfortunately happens to be the biggest part. So in order for this pairing of a set and some well-defined binary operation to actually be a group, they need to satisfy some particular axioms. An axiom is just some logical statement that we assume to be true, and then from that we can go on to deduce logical results that follow directly. There are four axioms that need to be satisfied by the set and the binary operation to form a group. The first of those is closure. If S forms a group under the action of some binary operation, then the axiom of closure says that for all x and y that are elements of the set, then x dot y is also an element of the set. Note that here I'm using some mathematical logic notation. So closure is really just saying that if I combine any two elements in the set, the result will always be another element in the set. This forms a good test for if you've been given some set and an operation, and you want to see if they form a group. For example, say I have this set and my operation is addition. We can immediately see that 2 plus 3 is 5. 5 is not an element of the set, so the axiom of closure can't be true for all elements in the set. So we can immediately rule this out as forming a group, as it doesn't satisfy the axiom of closure. We didn't even need to know what the other three axioms were. That being said, let's look at the second one. The second axiom is associativity. This axiom states that for every x, y, and z in the set, if we first combine y and z, and then combine that with x, it's the same thing as combining z with the combination of x and y. This is essentially the statement that ordering doesn't really matter. We can write x dot y dot z without any brackets to specify which ones to combine first. It just doesn't matter. The third axiom concerns what's known as an identity element. It states that there exists some element, usually denoted e, such that for any element x in the set, x dot e is equal to e dot x, which is just equal to x. In short, there must exist an element that leaves any other element in the set unchanged. It's worth noting that we only need to be able to prove that the identity element exists. We don't in theory need to know specifically what it is, although 90% of the time we do. And finally, we come to the fourth axiom, which is the existence of inverses. This states that for every element in the set, there exists another element in the set, such that combining them in either order produces the identity element. So this is kind of like how 1 over x is the multiplicative inverse of x. x times 1 over x equals 1, which is the multiplicative identity. But of course, the reach of binary operations in group theory, as we'll shortly see, extends far beyond just simple multiplication and addition. So really, the idea of an inverse is quite general. Finally, we're ready to move on to looking at some actual interesting applications of group theory. Let's say we have a shape, like an equilateral triangle. I'm interested in studying the different ways I can transform this shape. Firstly, I want to label parts of the triangle, so I can keep track of their relative positions. Like this. So how can I transform it? Well, there are two simple things I can do. 
I can rotate it, say 120 degrees anti-clockwise. We can call this rotation R. We could also rotate it anti-clockwise by 240 degrees and call this rotation Q. Or I could reflect it in one of three axes. The Y axis, the Y equals X axis, or the Y equals minus X axis, labelled as such. We may also want to define an identity transformation, I, which just does nothing. This is all well and good, but as mathematicians, we want to explore how these transformations relate to each other. We could imagine taking a triangle and first rotating it 120 degrees. This would be the R transformation. Then we could say rotate it by 240 degrees, the Q transformation. What exactly have we done here? Well, we can see that the shape we're left with is exactly the same as the one we started with. In other words, we've left the shape unchanged. So applying R and then Q is the same as applying the identity transformation. We might wonder if there are similar relations for more complicated combinations. Say we first transform by R and then reflect the shape in the line Y equals X. What do we get then? Well, evidently, this is just the same as reflecting in the line y equals minus x. Clearly, if we construct the set S to contain all of our transformations, and then say that our binary operation acting on the set is just the composition of transformations, i.e. just doing one transformation after the other, we might be able to find some underlying mathematical structure, like a group. To explore this, we could construct a kind of table, with the first column containing the first transformation, and the first row containing the second transformation, and then fill in all of the equivalent transformations, like so. What we've constructed here is a Cayley table. Cayley tables are very common in finite group theory. The most obvious feature we can extract from this Cayley table is that our set is closed. Every element in the set appears once in each row and column of the table, so we've satisfied the axiom of closure. Next up on our group theory checklist is associativity. Now if we had time, we could go through every combination of three elements and show that the set is associative, which would certainly be quicker with the aid of the Cayley table. But in the interest of time, I hope you'll trust me that this set certainly expresses associativity. As for the identity, well, we know that it exists, because when we started, we explicitly defined the identity element. So that's three of our four group axioms satisfied. Finally, we come to the existence of inverses. If we look carefully at each row of the Cayley table, we see that the identity element appears once in each row, in a column that corresponds to the inverse element. The structure we have here is called the identity skeleton of the table. It's also useful to note that some of the transformations, namely the reflections, are their own inverses. We call elements like these self-inverse. So we have shown that for each element in the set, there exists an inverse element. So of this Cayley table, we have successfully shown that the set of transformations on an equilateral triangle along with the binary operation of composition, forms a group. This might seem quite arbitrary, but in fact it hints at some far more general properties about groups. What we've formed here is a symmetry group of a triangle. It might not surprise you to hear that symmetry groups exist for all regular polygons. Moving on to the final part of our discussion, let's briefly look at one more group. Consider this set of matrices under the binary operation of matrix multiplication. As you can probably guess, we're going to form a Cayley table to see if this set forms a group. But firstly, note that I is a 2x2 two two identity matrix, so we've immediately identified the identity element of this set. Now, in the interest of time, I'm just going to show you what the Cayley table will look like, but I would encourage you to try and work out a few of the combinations. Upon working out each of the combination of matrices, we get this Cayley table. The arguments used to show that the previous set forms a group can also be applied directly here. Clearly, this set of matrices, under the operation of matrix multiplication, forms a group. Now, if you have a keen eye, you might notice that this Cayley table looks pretty much identical to the one for the triangle symmetry group. This might be partly aided by my suggestive labelling of the matrices. But if you look at the placement of the identity elements in each Cayley table, you'll notice that they're in exactly the same place. In other words, it looks like the Cayley tables have the same multiplicative structure. And as curious mathematicians, we may like to define a map between the groups that preserves a multiplicative structure. By this, we mean some association of an element in one group to another, say, from S to T. We don't necessarily have to have every element in T being mapped to, but if there does exist a mapping where each element in T gets mapped to by only one element in S, in other words, the mapping is bijective, then we call this an isomorphism, and the two groups are said to be isomorphic. As you may have guessed, 
the two groups we've just looked at are in fact isomorphic. So what does that isomorphism look like? Well, obviously the identity elements would have to map to each other. And after that, the most obvious choice is to map all the elements that look similar to each other, like so. As we've just seen, this will produce a Cayley table of the same structure. This is a reflection of a more formal property of an isomorphism. Say we call the map between the two groups F. Then formally, we require that if we first combine the elements in S and then map the resulting element to T, we get the same element if we first map from S to T and then combine the elements. There's a lot of detail to go into with isomorphisms and the slightly weaker case of a homomorphism. And group theory is a huge area of pure mathematics in itself with a lot to talk about. So unfortunately, we'll have to leave the rest for future videos.